Hi everyone, we're so glad you could join us today. I'm Manita Sedgwick, Director of Marketing and Sales at Usability Matters, and I'm the host of this webinar series, Putting Users in UX. Thanks for joining us. In this series, we introduce you to research methods that bring your audience, the people, the people that will be using your product into your user experience. Just a reminder that the slides and a full recording of episode one are available on our blog. The URL is usabilitymatters, all one word, dot com. Uh, just wanted to add, we're really excited to have launched our new website just this morning, so we'll hope you'll visit it. Today is episode two. We're going to discuss research methods for design. And in the latter part of June, we'll dive into the important mechanics of planning, conducting, and analyzing your research. We'll hope you'll join us then. A little bit about Usability Matters. We are a strategy, research, and design studio located in Toronto. For over 13 years, clients from multiple industries have leaned on our team of experts to deliver remarkable design. As a whole, we thrive in complexity, and clients will tell us that they truly enjoy collaborating with us because of our dedication to their business and a commitment to finding the right solution. Before we start, I'd like to highlight a couple of housekeeping items. First off, we'll be covering a ton of information today, so please don't worry about taking notes. We'll be emailing you the link with the slides and the full recording. And of course, our audience, from our audience, we love questions. Send us as many as you can, as many as you can think of, and don't um, hesitate to post those using the question tab found on the GoToWebinar panel on your screen. About halfway through, we'll pause briefly to uh, answer a few of those questions from the audience, and at the very end, we'll be sure to answer as many as, as we can. Our presenters for today and throughout the series are Terry Cosentino, one of the principals at Usability Matters, and Stephen LeMay, a UX practitioner who has been with us for almost all of its 13 years. I'm now going to turn it over to Terry to get us started. Thanks so much, Anita. So today, uh, what we're going to talk about is uh, the UX process and the research process, just as by way of uh, background, before we dive into four methods that we use during uh, design, card sorting, usability testing, collaborative sketching, and online discussion. The aim here is to help you understand these uh, research methods, when to use them, and most importantly, why you might want to use them. So there are three phases in a typical UX process, strategy, design, and development, and research feeds into all of these phases. In episode one, we discussed some of the key methods used during strategy, and today we're going to talk about methods used during design. You'll notice that usability testing appears in all three phases. In strategy, we may test the current version of a product as an input to the design of the next version, or to help make a business case for the need to do a redesign. We most often use usability testing during design where it can have the greatest impact on the new design. And we're gonna talk about that quite a bit today. And in production, we may do it as part of user experience, uh, sorry, user acceptance testing or as an input to iterative design improvements. No matter what type of research you're doing, these are the key steps in the process. Determining the objectives, planning, recruiting, conducting, and then analyzing and reporting. And this is exactly what we're going to dig into further in episode three in June. However, let's take a couple of minutes just to discuss research objectives. In the UX process, there are two main reasons to conduct research, to generate ideas, we call that generative, and to evaluate ideas and designs, and we call that evaluative. During strategy, we generate and then evaluate the big ideas to decide what we're designing. And during design, we generate and evaluate the designs themselves. In research, uh, in either phase, your research might be mostly generative or mostly evaluative. However, research will often include some activities that are generative and others that are evaluative. For example, in the design phase, you might get a user to brainstorm all the types of content they would want to see on your website at the beginning of a session and then get them to review your prototype in the second part of the session. 
Obviously, the first activity will shape how they respond to the second activity. If you reverse these activities and had the user look at your prototype and then brainstorm the types of content, the content they identify and the words they use would have been strongly influenced by having just looked at your prototype. So in our research, we often put the generative activities before the evaluative activities in any given session. To get a little more concrete, here's an example of some of the objectives for a usability test. When we work with clients, we suggest they write down all the things they'd like to know about their product. And some are very conceptual, like the first bullet in the first section, do participants understand the offer? And then some are more tactical, like the first bullet in the second section. Are participants able to understand the requirements for subscribing? When we take all the questions and we group and prioritize them, from this we can get the objectives and these problem statements. And it also helps us decide what method to use to answer these questions. For example, in this case, the questions indicated a usability test as the best method. And although a usability test is mostly evaluative, as I mentioned, you might use some generative activities as well. For example, to get information to cover the third bullet, uh, is there enough of the right kinds of information on the site for participants to make the decision to subscribe? We could ask each participant early on what type of information they feel they would need to make a decision to subscribe to the given service and then get their evaluation of the page with the subscription information on it later in the session. Okay, enough background. For the remainder of our webinar, we'll focus on some research methods for the design phase of a project. Again, we're going to introduce you to each of these methods, talk about how, when, and why to use them, and hopefully give you the confidence to work them into your own UX efforts. So my colleague Stephen will start us off with card sorting. All right, thanks very much, Terry. So the first of these methods that we're gonna dive into um, is perhaps the easiest and maybe even the most familiar one, which is, makes it a good place to start. Um, it's really a terrific and simple way for getting users into the design process. Now, card sorting, uh, it's really just a simple technique for understanding how people think about information. How do they group things and what do they call those groups? So the cards that we mentioned for in the sorting, on those cards you simply write the names of your, your web pages or the content elements or the actions that you want people to sort. Cards can be paper cards, index cards or little sheets of paper handwritten or printed out, um, or you can use um, an online tool such as Optimal Sort, and you end up with virtual cards that people move around. In either case, you give your participants uh, a stack of cards, and uh, you ask each participant in the study uh, to sort those cards into groups. And usually this is done one-on-one. -on -one. It's not a group activity, typically. So when they're done sorting, you gather up all of the results from all of your individual sessions, and you look for patterns in how the cards have been grouped and the names that have been given to those groups. Now, the great thing about online tools is they, that they allow us, uh, or they allow lots of people to participate from anywhere in the world. They're a, uh, and they're a great help with recording and analyzing the results. Now we use card sorting because it's the best way to, uh, well, because the best way to help people find information is to organize it in a way that, ma that matches the way they think of it. Card sorting uh, is a technique that allows you to uncover how they think of it, what their mental model is for the given information space. That is, they being the audience of, for your particular product, and they being not the designer and not the organizer and the stakeholders, how they think about the information, but how the people who will actually use it in the end think about that information. This is why card sorting is often used uh, to design a navigation model. Um, you, the, what should the main sections of a website be called, for example, and then what should be in each of those sections. 
you know, there, there are two variations of card sorting, open and close, and I'll, I'll just speak a little bit about those two variations. An open card sort is where you ask people to organize the cards into groups and then provide a name for each of those groups. This helps you decide what the buckets of information should be called and what should go into them. By contrast, closed card sorting um, provides a, a set of predefined groups and you ask people to sort the cards into those predefined groups. Closed card, card sorting is a, a great inexpensive way to try out uh, different organization ideas very quickly. And sometimes we uh, use them together. So we'll sometimes start with the same set of cards, start by doing an open sort and let people uh, name their own groups and then ask them to sort the same cards or perhaps a different set, but usually the same cards into it, as Stephen says, a, something that the design team has predetermined. Uh, and this is a great way to, um, to, to get a lot more data and, and to, to go to be able to, as you say, do that navigation model. Yeah. Um, so the navigation model is one of the ways that card sorting is often used, uh, but we also use it for other aims in the design process. There's a couple of really good examples of other ways to use it that, you know, that we've used recently. Um, in one example recently, we used um, online card sorting to help design the navigation structure for a telephone IVR system. So there were no pages per se, but it was a, still a, a structure and an organization. And we had to make sure that the, that the options were where people expected them to be. We've also used card sorting to determine what was critical and what was less critical on a homepage. And that's real estate that people always fight over. So any way that uh, we can help prioritize what goes on that page and help identify those things that can fall off to a deeper page is really terrific. Um, and we've also used uh, card sorting in much more of a, a, a data intense design scenario for um, a publisher where you know, each of the books that the publisher publishes has a whole whack of different data fields that are associated with each book. These dozens and dozens of data fields um, we threw into a card sort in order to help us organize those fields into logical groups and then to order those groups in a way that best supported the day-to-day -day workflow. All right, so it was a quick look at card sorting, um, a fairly, fairly simple technique, but usability testing, we're gonna spend a little bit more time on this one because there's a whole lot of different variations involved. Now, when we talk about usability testing, really what we're talking about is finding the cracks in the sidewalk that people will trip over and fixing them. We do this by asking people to accomplish typical tasks with a system or with a design and watch for the places that they struggle or fail. Typically we use a talk aloud methodology. We ask participants to tell us what they're thinking as they accomplish their tasks. Remember to probe when people pause or show frustration with this technique um, because they might not always be able to vocalize that immediately. So ask what they're thinking or what are they looking for? Another thing to keep an eye open for are nonverbal cues, like somebody sighing or folding their arms. Uh, and a great one that shows frustration is where they push back from the table. And again, when you notice these things, it's a great opportunity to probe for what those people are thinking. Rarely will we go back and review a task after it's been completed, because people just aren't very good at recollecting their thoughts, even if it was a task that they just finished. So generally, we feel the talk aloud method is best. Now there's a bunch of different approaches to usability testing for different circumstances or different points in the product life cycle. One of those pairs of facets that we talk about is formal versus informal testing. Now, formal is typically what most people think of when we talk about usability testing. Formal means, at least for us, that it's done in a lab setting with observers sitting behind one-way glass. 
Um, and we use this technique when it's important for product owners or stakeholders to witness people struggle with their product firsthand. This can be really eye-opening uh, because people very, you know, in many cases, they seldom have the opportunity to see people use their product. Formal testing also means that the participants are recruited by a professional recruiter based on a specific set of audience criteria. It also usually has a formal report of some kind, uh, very often uh, to support a business case that's seeking funding to go into the next version of the product or some similar variation of uh, a business case. And also with formal testing, uh, we're typically doing full session recordings, as well as highlight clips, uh, which are great for uh, illustrating key findings along the way. You know, we talk about a highlight reel that we produce that shows some of the most interesting uh, findings in the, and, and that support some of the recommendations that we're making coming out of the, the test. And we do do that with you know, tools like Moray or Silverback. Now, if there's a drawback to formal testing, it's typically the cost, the cost in terms of time, cost in terms of equipment and facilities. Informal testing, by contrast, aims to achieve the same outcomes, but to do so on a smaller budget. Use the, the same procedures, uh, but you can do it anywhere, essentially, in a meeting room or uh, even in a busy place or even on the street. We've had you know, a number of opportunities where we've done this right out in public. <clears throat> um, because it's informal, we may make the recruiting a little bit less formal as well, maybe done with friends and family type of recruiting or simply by grabbing people from the corridor for a few minutes. And we recently did this with the Toronto Public Library where we asked people after they had checked out their books if they could spare you know, five minutes to try out a new design. Informal testing may also have little or no documentation. And this is another uh, place where we save money in terms of time that goes into it. The recommendations are typically discussed with the project team um, and they may be listed in a PowerPoint, but that might be as formal as you get. Um, but really the recommendations uh, are, are plowed straight into the next design iteration. So informal testing can be done very inexpensively and if there's a drawback, I would say that it's just that the opportunities for observation may be a little bit more limited. But actually, that can be a great thing if, if perhaps you've never tried uh, doing usability testing before. Formal testing would be a great place to start, and maybe you don't so much want observers yeah. <laughs> that first time around. Um, but it's also, yeah, it's really just a, a really good place to, to start uh, getting your, your sea legs on that. Mm -hmm. So there's a place for both formal and informal testing, and we do lots of both on different projects. Another couple of uh, facets to think about with usability testing is uh, moderated versus unmoderated. Uh, now, we do mostly moderated testing on uh, at Usability Matters, and um, but you know, I'll talk a little bit about those differences. So moderated testing can be done in person or remotely, uh, but it always involves somebody who's facilitating the test, who's going through the script with the person, with the participant. And this facilitator probes for what the participant is thinking along the way. That's the talk aloud methodology. The results from moderated testing are qualitative. They involve the judgment of the analyst, um, <clears throat> Uh, and the part participants in the testing team. But the aim is really to, to find out not just what the problems are, but why they are problems, so that the appropriate modifications can be made to the design, so that we can make better informed recommendations. Now, unmoderated testing, by contrast, uh, can be done using an uh, automated tool, or there are some services like usertesting.com, which allow you to conduct unmoderated tests where you, you just let the test run essentially completely hands off. These kinds of uh, tests using these tools or, or uh, services, they allow you to do things like record how long a task takes to complete, 
because you're not interrupting the task at all. Uh, or they give you good measures of task success rates uh, with a large number of people. But keep in mind when doing these kinds of broader tests that they are not quantitative. There's a temptation to use the statistics that come out of these unmoderated results and think that they are statistically valid. Um, but really, it is qualitative. And you know, despite the, uh, the temptation to look at uh, percent of task success rate or average time to completion, these are not statistically valid. Now, the other hesitation that we might have with unmoderated testing uh, and lots of other techniques as well is that they can tell you what the issues are, but they're not as successful at helping you figure out why those are issues. So they may be, you know, unmoderated, unmoderated testing may be most useful when you're really trying to fine tune uh, tasks where you know, the time to completion is an essential goal of the research. But generally, we recommend moderated testing. Um, remote testing is, uh, is a, a you know, wonderful uh, twist that's you know, entered our testing toolkit in the last number of years. Um, with remote testing, it's really the same procedure uh, as with in-person testing. But in this case, the facilitator and the participant and the observers are not in the same room. And this uh, opens up the, the test to really for, to people from around the world. And this is really useful you know, here in Canada where we've got you know, such a, a large geography and we can test with different groups of people from coast to coast. It also allows participants to use their own computer in their own natural context uh, without bringing in travel expenses, either to bring the participants to us or for us to go out to the participants. So to do that, we, we use web conference software, uh, services like the one we're using today with GoToMeeting, but there's a bunch of variations um, that, that all work uh, on those sort of web conferencing solutions. If you want to see and record the participant with remote testing, they need to add a webcam into their mix on their end. And this extra bit of technology can add some real hurdles um, to, the, to the testing procedure. Uh, so typically, that's something that we will not include. We can't always guarantee that participants will have their own webcam. Um, and then even if they do, uh, the extra technology setup time and the hurdles just means that there's more chance of things going wrong, and um, we, you know, we often find we, we have to dedicate more time to. Uh, yeah, to and technology. we find that ultimately, uh, while it's nice to have a, a headshot of the person, what's really critical um, in conducting the research, but as well as analyzing it later, is the screen sh the, the screen movement and the audio. So what they're saying and what they're doing on the screen and. Uh, you know, the webcam is really a nice to have and, and therefore we do forego it um, for the reasons that Stephen mentioned. Yep. In-person testing, by contrast, has much more simple and predictable and well worked out technology. So those hurdles uh, aren't really present for in-person. Uh, and the other advantage of in-person is that um, because you're in the same room with the participant, it really opens up the ability to observe the rich nonverbal communication that happens all the time with people. So a little bit, um, you know, a really fascinating twist on the testing setup is when we've been bringing in mobile devices over the last few years. Uh, here you see a setup with uh, an iPad and an iPhone where we were testing a website on both devices. But there's a bunch of different challenges that come with um, testing on mobile devices. And the technology, while it's getting better, it's still a bit complicated. It can be a little bit difficult to see and record what's on a, a person's screen. Uh, and you know, this is a, in particular is an area where the technology is getting better. It's not quite there yet. 
But in, this, in the setup that you're seeing here in this particular photo, we mirrored what was on the participant's mobile device, either the iPad or the, or the iPhone. We mirrored that to the uh, analyst's laptop screen. And we used a webcam to capture the uh, participant's face and expressions as we typically would. And then a, a third webcam was added into the mix here that captured the participant actually holding the device or not, or moving it around the table. And this allowed us to get a sense of, um, for the interactions of this particular website, what made most sense for people? Did they um, prefer landscape or portrait? Did they switch in between? Um, how, how much actual physical movement was, was involved in using the, the system. So that third camera was useful. So even when, uh, as the uh, technology is evolving and we'll be able to do screen capture directly from mobile devices, and there's a few, uh, a few of those on the market now, uh, there may still be an advantage to this type of setup where you can see the, the, the participants' hands. Mm -hmm. As Stephen said, for switching uh, from uh, portrait to landscape, but also uh, just seeing their finger and where it goes and how easily do they tap a certain target. These can be really important uh, cues for the design team later. Yeah. The drawback here with this kind of setup, though, is that it can't really be done in the field very well. And that, of course, means some of the richness of, of mo interacting with mobiles, using mobiles in different contexts. Um, we we might miss out on some of that uh, that some of that real world context. Another great variation on usability testing that we do a lot of, particularly early on in the design phase, is paper prototype testing. In the design phase, we're generally testing some form of a prototype at some point, and prototypes can be very very simple or they can be quite robust. But before there's a, a, an electronic working prototype, often there's some sort of a design that exists just on paper. Sometimes they're just sketches, or sometimes they're a little bit more elaborate like this one that you see here in this photograph. And the idea is to test early and test often. So paper prototyping allows us to test early before any investment's been made in any sort of electronic prototype. Um, and gives us really rich feedback before uh, a great deal of investment's been made. It's cheap, it's simple, um, and you know, one of the interesting things about it is that w while the it might seem like there's something unnatural with working with paper where the um, you, you might have you ask the participant to tap or to click on something and then the uh, the moderator changes or serves up the next page. That might sound a bit unnatural, but it actually becomes quite natural very quickly. Now that intervention of the, uh, the moderator to serve up the next page when somebody clicks or taps on something is why it's often called a Wizard of Oz approach. So you might hear that phrase used. Um, so because it's done early, Paper prototype testing is really a great way for testing the navigation design and the organization of your system. Um, and it's great for testing multi-step processes. Great. So I think we're going to pause now. Uh, I think Anita has a few questions uh, from the, the listeners. Yes, we have a few great questions. First one, uh, do you have any recommendations for software methods? or methods for unmoderated usability testing, and also for remote moderated usability testing. I think the ones that we mentioned uh, come to mind right off the bat. Uh, mm -hmm. So uh, the user uh, testing.com for the um, unmoderated. And for moderated, we use you know very much the kind of software we're using today, like GoToMeeting or um, JoinMe or, or um, Adobe Connect, and there's a bunch of different ones. Yeah. And then for recording. The, the example that we looked at in that photograph of the, that elaborate mobile setup, uh, this one here, we used uh, a, 
a, some software called uh, Air Display, I believe it's called, to allow us to mirror the iPhone or the iPad onto a Mac screen. Um, and that way we could use the typical screen recording software that we use on the laptop, we use uh, Silverback for that purposes, uh, to capture, in fact, all three camera inputs at the same time. And in fact, we mirrored that to the observation room for the client uh, uh, observers. Yep. So, um, so yeah, so there's, there is often two or three things. You need usually a recording software, mm -hmm. some way for other people to view what's going on, um, and that might be via the web conference software. That's a great answer. Well, just a quick, another quick question from Barbara. Why aren't the methods used in unmoderated usability testing considered statistically invalid? Right. So they're actually not, not considered statistically valid. And, uh, and it's not impossible for them to be uh, statistically valid. It's just not typical of the way that people use them. So... Uh, we could go into some depth around what it means to be statistically valid, but you have to have a population that, uh, a, a, a representative population and understanding exactly how they are representative uh, would be quite a task in itself. So again, it's not impossible, it's just unlikely in the way that most of us use them. The other thing is that during design, uh, the kind of qualitative methods that we tend to use and, and, and others in our field are more about deriving design insights and uh, things that will resonate with the, with the design team. So if you see something happening over and over again, obviously that's going to deepen that resonance. Um, but uh, to my mind, honestly, I would uh, prefer to see something go into an A-B test in a live environment beyond uh, necessarily doing unmoderated. Uh, on moderated testing, or another interesting use of moderated testing might be to test two, two versions of an experience and compare them. Mm -hmm. uh, but again, um, the effort needed to make something statistically valid isn't usually necessary for a design team. It's just, I mean, the point there is that what you get out of the unmoderated testing is very often numbers. And then we, we put a lot of weight in those numbers um, but sometimes we can overemphasize that. We can think that they are valid statistics when really they are a pointer towards a trend. Right. To be able to say that 50% of the people succeeded in a test, you would have to know that those those 50, the, those people that participated were absolutely representative of your audience in order to predict, essentially, which is what quantitative uh, research does, to predict the success in the greater population. So it's, 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 it, it requires a level of rigor that is generally too high a bar for most of us. I understand that kind of rigor is also more appropriate for large enterprise, would you say? As opposed to small no, I'd say it for different stages right. of the process. Okay. Yeah, during design, it's I think it's of more limited use. Okay. One other um, uh, person that was, is attending would like to know what A and B stands for in A B testing. Uh, okay. Well, we we often um, talk about A B testing. They're they're really alternate various. There's a bunch of different names for this technique, but typically it means you have two different designs and you ask one group to use one design and another group to use another design and you compare which group has more success, whatever the measure of success is. It could be more people sign up or more people complete the process or more people get the uh, task accomplished in a shorter amount of time. So having two different variations that you put up and you get different groups of people to um, to look at can be really useful. Um, this is becoming more and more uh, everyday practice for some organizations where they talk about having a champion design and they bring in a competitor. A challenger. A challenger, yes. right. <laughs> and if the challenger be, uh, performs better on a particular measure than the current champion, the challenger becomes the champion. And then they bring in another challenger, and this can be an ongoing part of. And you see process. some of the big, robust uh, uh, players like an eBay or an Amazon might do this for something like a, 
a, a buy flow. They might be diverting people into two separate buy flows, and uh, and usually the the champion is the current one, and the challenger is the new one. And as Stephen says, until the challenger outperforms, and that's ve- you know that's where you get really quantitative data. But it's uh, it, so that's what the A B means. It means option A, option B, essentially. Right. Great. Okay. okay. So we should probably continue and then we'll take some more questions at the end. Mm -hmm. So don't uh, hesitate to send in uh, additional questions. So what we're going to talk about now is collaborative sketching. And like usability testing, there are lots of ways to do collaborative sketching. And it's when people get together to sketch the flow or screens in a user experience uh, design. It involves simple materials like whiteboards, markers, paper, and sticky notes. And it's typically done in small groups of around two or three people, but you can have many small groups. So if you've got a larger group, you can break them up into a bunch of small groups. And these groups might sketch the same experience or different parts of an overall experience. It depends what you're trying to achieve. The main reason to sketch is to involve a group of people in the hands-on design of the flow or the screens of a user experience who may not necessarily be designers by, by profession. It's generally used to generate ideas and capture concepts and even to come to consensus about which ideas to use in the next iteration of a design. However, it's usually not the most practical way to do detailed design work on an interface. So we've held collaborative sketching sessions with all kinds of users, but the example I'm going to share with you today was actually conducted with our clients at the Heart and Stroke Foundation. However, this isn't them in the photo. <laughs> we were redesigning an online tool together and had a lot of requirements already. And of course, we already had the existing tool. We needed some way to get beyond the current tool and to dream about a new version. So we split into three groups and there were two people in each group, one client and one designer. Each of the groups sketched a new experience involving this tool. And when we shared our results, we were so excited about some of the great new ideas uh, that were sparked. And this generated even more ideas amongst the six of us while we were um, reviewing each other's uh, sketches. So many of these ended up becoming part of the new user experience. And there were both uh, internal stakeholders and uh, representative users as well involved in these uh, sketching sessions. In this one, there wasn't. It was just designers and client, but we have done that. For example, we did that uh, collaborative sketching with um, uh, university students and professors uh, as part of an overall, essentially an overall focus group. But what we did is after providing some background to all of the uh, participants, we broke them up into small groups and they uh, sketched essentially a new experience for uh, doing um, academic research. Okay. So we have definitely used it with uh, different kinds of groups. And our last method today is online discussions, which are pretty much exactly what they sound like, conversations online. However, they're facilitated conversations and they're well planned in advance. So just like any other methods, you start by determining the objectives. And the objectives will determine what type of people you need for the conversation and how to find them. This method is great for getting lots of voices into the conversation, regardless of their location and time zone. And since people can't, sorry, since people can participate from their own environment and at their own pace, it works well for including people who use assistive technologies or have impairments that would be barriers to their participation. However, online discussions only work if you have interested audiences that will participate either in your social media presence through Facebook, Twitter, blog, or if, if they'll participate online through direct invitation, uh, perhaps by email. There was a, an example that spoke exactly to, the, to these particular points where we used a facilitated online discussion with, um, for the uh, government of Ontario to get input into uh, policy around um, accessibility. And so the audience that we spoke to were incredibly passionate about how issues of accessibility could improve, further improve their lives. Um, and so the, the discussions were really active. 
because of that degree of investment. Well, and also in that particular case, uh, we ran it as a two-day threaded discussion. So people knew what the time frame of participation was, and they were also uh, given incentives to participate. So uh, they, they had lots of passion, but you know, giving them some incentives didn't hurt incentives either. Incentives never help. I uh, never, never hurt either. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it was a great way to get to get people involved. So it's important to keep in mind that the conversation is between you and your audiences, but the real reason for doing the online discussion is also to have the audience members talking amongst themselves. And so usually the moderator will introduce artifacts like designs or maybe pages from a competitor website or other things for people to talk about. And then we ask those participants to comment. Then the moderator will monitor the conversation, chiming in to ask questions or introduce additional ideas or other artifacts uh, as part of the discussion. So when you share designs, it's important to accept feedback graciously and not defend your design. However, it's, it's okay to be really honest about some of the considerations that were uh, given and some of the constraints that might have led to that particular design, just not in a defensive way. So, of course, the moderator needs to be friendly and professional throughout the exchange. And here's an example from a project we did with the Toronto Public Library. Over a six-month period, client members of the design team posted updates, questions, and designs to the web team blog, like in this post, which talks about some of the challenges the design team is grappling with and poses some specific questions encouraging library members to comment on the screen capture which is a new concept for the account, sum, uh, account summary screen, and it's seen here on the right. This post generated, I think it was 29 comments, and uh, they you know, were mostly quite positive and very constructive, great ideas. Some were more critical. Nonetheless, the library staff re replied promptly, openly, and always really professional. The post also prompted a lively discussion about borrowing history, a feature desired by many of the library members. However, others raised privacy concerns. So library members, uh, the library staff acknowledged those concerns and talked about their plans to mitigate them by making borrowing history optional, which people chimed in with a lot of support for. So that brings us to a conclusion for today. We've uh, put together this handy one-page chart which compares the research methods that we talked about today, and those will be um, uh, available on our blog uh, in the next day or so, along with, uh, I think, the slides and, um, and the uh, recording. It's a great cheat sheet for the methods that we talked about um, and the what, why, and when of when to use them. Yeah, there might even be some additional methods there that we haven't talked about today. Okay, so I think we're going over to Anita for some questions. Yeah, we have a whole bunch more that have come in. Uh, all right, uh, which type of card sorting typically provides the richest results, open or closed? Well, you use them differently. They both provide uh, very rich results. Um, I think we use open card sorting more frequently because we want to get at the words that people have in their own minds uh, when they're thinking about the, the information that we're talking about. Uh, but there's a real specific place for cl closed card sorting as well um, to test the organization structure that you've devised. So often you would do open and then closed uh, at different points, but they, they're both quite rich. Yeah, one time we uh, what we did for a client uh, after having you know worked with them to, to to consider our options, was we did a closed sort on their current structure and a closed sort on the proposed structure, just to see if people found it easier to group things. Um, so there are you know yeah. there's lots of variations, but as Stephen said, both are very rich. And this is an illustration of the distinction between generative and evaluative, as Terry has talked about. Open card sorting is generative in that you're getting ideas and information from people and closed card sorting is evaluative where you're testing the labels that you've put on things. Yeah. Okay. Um, another question around card sorting, do you let users rename or add cards? 
We usually do. Yeah. 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 There's usually a, a pen at hand. Um, that's what we kind of like about the um, the paper card sort, even though the there's lots of great advantages to the uh, to the virtual one as well. And you can get people to add cards to those. Don't get me wrong, but there's something very lightweight about paper. People realize that you you know they don't feel like you put a ton of of effort in so far, so they feel I think more they're more ready to make changes. So sure, we see people pick up a pen and say, can I rename this? Or we may even say at the beginning, and we for sure go back and say, are there any card, or even before they start, any cards that are unclear, uh, et cetera. So we can also find out which of those labels is not working. Yeah. People can get stuck pretty easily when they come across something that's tough to make a decision about. So one of the other things that we often do is encourage people to, you know, if they're stuck, create a group for the stuff that I have no idea what it is or I don't know about so they can put that aside deal with the rest and then revisit those at the end because suddenly given the context of the other choices that they've made that may now make some sense to them where it didn't before or they may see a home for it where they didn't initially or they might write the same card again so they can put it into groups and that's fair too yeah, yeah. that's a good point okay uh is it important that the two designs in A-B testing are very different from one another, or is it worth testing very simple changes in the design? Well, in the kinds of evaluative testing that we do in our, you know, as consultants in user experience, the distinctions are often fairly significant. But that doesn't mean you can't use it for really subtle things as well. Um, and, and companies do do this. Do people respond better to this shade of blue versus that shade of blue? You know, really subtle yeah, distinctions. Yeah, the button on the it. left, the button on the right. So, yes, so sometimes for sure, uh, especially when something is live A-B testing, so you're going out to, to people who are using it, um, the, the distinctions might be actually quite subtle, um, but then you might do more iterative design. So instead of putting a completely different one, you put the slightly different one and keep moving uh, along those tracks. Back to that champion. Uh, exactly. Yeah. yeah. I mean, mm -hmm. you could, depending on the in the technical environment that the client has, they could be A-B testing constantly. Right. Are there any specific tools that you would use for A-B testing? One of the uh, attendees would like to know uh, more about uh, potentially your recommendations on optimizely um, user voice. Yeah, there's a, a bunch of tools out there and it's being built into content management systems. So the tool of choice is really going to depend a lot on the given technology environment. Um, I'm not sure that we have any specific recommendation because the technology environment can be very different from one client to another for us. It's it's generally more uh, a decision made by our clients. Yeah, yeah. The, by the technology team yeah. at the client side. Yeah. Yeah. There's another great question on card sorting. Uh, would you do you see any constraints or downsides with card sorting? Some any that you're aware of potentially? Well, there's always you know the, the downside of asking people their opinion mm. is that you get their opinion. Yeah. <laughs> Sometimes Fast. people don't want that. You know, we, we actually work on projects where it's clear that the only opinion that matters is the CEO's opinion <laughs> or, yeah. uh, or people are really closed to seeing things from another perspective. Mm. And that would really be the only drawback. That I, can I mean, imagine. it can generate quite a bit of, of data and interpreting the data does take some uh, experience, I yep. think. Um, but it's always, you know, in our experience, it's always worth doing it. Yeah. Okay. Um, with respect to cards, do you occasionally work on a vertical workspace such as Kanban board? Can't say that we do. I'm not familiar with that tool. No? No. No, we haven't tended to do that, but I don't see any reason why it couldn't be done on vertical space. Sure. Uh, there's something nice about the ease of sliding things around on a table. Mm -hmm. um, so that, that might be a little missing from a vertical space, but otherwise uh, I can't think of anything. Yeah. Okay. Uh, let's see, and I think there was one more question. How do you tackle the challenge of recruiting the right users quickly? Um, 
Do you find companies that do this? And are there any particular challenges in recruiting teenagers, for example? So this sounds like a perfect segue to our next episode. So I'm afraid we can't answer this in in full here today, but we will uh, for sure make sure we include those specific markets like teen and some of those more challenging recruits and and speed of recruit in our section on recruiting. But the next uh, episode, we'll talk about planning, recruiting, conducting, and analyzing and reporting. And that'll be across methods. So uh, great recruiting questions. In a short answer, anything you want to add, Stephen? Well, we do use professional recruiters on a a, a frequent basis. um, And uh, it's been rare that we've not been able to recruit the particular audience that we're looking for, um, even when it's quite specific. So you know, we recruited for one particular set of tests. We wanted to make sure that we got um, parents of young children who um, did not have secondary um, high sc- or secondary school graduation. Um, it's pretty specific and we were able to recruit that. Now, quickly is a, is a qualification that will, you know, people have different definitions of quickly depending on the given project and time frame. So, uh, you know, if it's really quickly, testing with anybody is better than testing with a carefully chosen audience. So if all you've got time for is to run out and grab somebody from the corridor, do it. Yeah, great. Okay. Terry, Stephen, thank you so much. That was fantastic. Join us in a few weeks where we'll dive into the important mechanics of planning, conducting, and analyzing your research. This is beneficial for those to those who really want to learn how to craft a proper research plan and deploy the right steps for successful research, no matter what method you use. And it includes recruiting, even though we didn't mention right. that. Right. Thanks, Terry. Okay. Thank you very much, everybody. Uh, For listening in, we promise we'll follow up with an email where we'll share the link to download the full recording of this webinar as well as the slides. We'll be posting a summary, uh, that summary slide as well that was referenced by uh, Terry earlier. This one pager uh, will really help you um, assess the best methods for your organization. Please keep it handy. And uh, Usability Matters, we have ongoing resources, articles, and updates on upcoming events, all on our website, usabilitymatters.com. And if you can follow us on Twitter, that's also a handy place to get a lot of uh, great information on user experience. At you matters. At you matters. That's right. That's where you got to go to get that Twitter. <laughs> exactly. Good point. Thanks, Stephen. Uh, please be sure to register for our next webinar, where we will focus on ways to collaborate. Uh, sorry, no, just uh, in our next webinar. Um, and thank you very much again for uh, for joining us.